Similarly, we could look at government as the art of governing. So we said we can look at government as the art of governing. What are we trying to say here? We're trying to say that what the government basically does is govern. They govern, they control, they guide, they implement. So we're saying government as a body is responsible for governing its people. Right? So, and that's why we see that we have various forms of government because there are various ways in which people, countries, states can be governed. So we simply said government as an act, as an, as an act of governing, simply we can define government under this as a body responsible for governing the states. Lastly, we could look at government as an academic field of study. This is very, very important. This is because government is related to so many areas. Government as an academic field of study. Government is related to numerous diverse areas. And you cannot excel in those professions if you have not conceptualized yourself with, you know, what government is, its elements, its principles, how it works. You know, so there are various um, fields of studies that directly relate to government. We have, most importantly, international relations. We have politics, you know, how Nigeria is ruled, all of that, politics. We have political theses. Right, so these are various fields of study that involve us learning and knowing more about what we do here in government and you know, how governments govern. Now bringing it down to the elements of government. The first thing we're going to be looking at today is what we call the arms of government. Now, you might ask yourself, what do you mean by the arms of government? What are arms of government? Do you mean the federal government, the state government? No, I do not. The arms of government can be seen as an organ through which, you know, the entire governmental body is divided into three major functions. So we have the arms of government divided into three organs. We have the executive, we have the legislature, and then we have the judiciary. The roles of these various arms of government is usually defined or confined in the constitution of that state. However, the components and makeup also vary depending on, you know, the country we're in and how exactly they make up these various arms of government. So today we're going to be looking at the arms of government. We're going to look at the various definitions of these arms. We're going to dissect them. We look at the benefits, you know, the types, and look at concepts that are very relevant to these various arms of government. Like I mentioned earlier, most constitutions usually set out, you know, the powers of these various arms of government, right? And, then, and that's why it's important that we look at them so that we know who is what and we classify them properly. So let's start with the first, which is the executive. Who are the executives? We said the executive is an organ or arm of government responsible for the implementation of policies. So we said this is the arm responsible for the implementation. and formulation of policies. So you might ask yourself, what exactly are policies? Policies are slightly different from laws because they are sort of rules and guides given to control the affairs of whatever it is the policy was created for. 
So the major function of the executive arm of government is to implement and formulate these laws. Now you can ask yourself, who makes up the executive body? Right? So examples are the number one man in the federation, the president. Right? So the president is a member of the executive arm of government. In the UK, we can have what we call the prime minister. Right? All the governors of your various states are members of the executive body. So we have governors. We have ministers. We have civil servants. We have the police. We have armed forces. ETC. Now, this is a very typical jam question. Which of the following is not a member of the executive arm? And then they put options, various options, and they put police there. And then most times we always assume that the police should be maybe a member of the judiciary since they are interpreting the law. But no. What the police actually does, or the role of the police, is to implement the laws that have already been created. So we can add here implementation of laws and formulation of policies. And that is why when you break the law, maybe when you pass a red light, it is, you know, police, LASMA, that enforce those laws. So another word we can use for implementation is enforcement. So the roles of the executive revolve around implementing and enforcing the laws, you know, that have been created for the state or the country. Now, we need to ask ourselves, what are the types of executives that we have? So we have types of executive. So basically, there are two forms. We could either have the single or plural executive, or we could have the parliamentary or non-parliamentary executive. Please be, not, be reminded that in the UK, right, the executive is known as cabinet. That's what they are called, cabinet. However, in Nigeria, in the US, we just simply call them executives. Now, let's break this down. What do we regard as single executive? For single executive, we're simply saying that the control or you know, the entire executive body is under the control of a single individual. For example, here in Nigeria. In Nigeria, the entire executive body is controlled by one man, which is President Mohamed Buhari. However, he has, you know, a body of advisors. These advisors are not his colleagues, rather they work for him. So they are agents and advisors to the one man that controls everything. That's why we call it a single executive. On the other hand, for there to have a plural executive um, body or system, it means that there is a council of executives. So, so let's put that here. When we talk of single executive, we're looking at control in one individual. However, when we talk of plural, plural executive, here we said control is within a council of executives. So we have control in a council of executives. Now, those agents and advisors that we had when we were explaining the single executives, they are no longer, they, do, they no longer work for this, for the, the person in control. Rather, within the council, 
the president would be a chairman and the advisors and agents are simply his colleagues. So I hope you see the difference here. It means that for a plural executive, there's a group of people involved in controlling, implementing, and enforcing laws and policies. However, for single, there's just one man doing that control, and then he has aids and guide from you know, agents and advisors. The next one we need to look at is the parliamentary or non-parliamentary executive. This is very simple. In the parliamentary executive, right? The head or the controller of the executive in this state, maybe the president, is there under the recommendation and appointment of the parliament and would lose his position when the parliament no longer has confidence in him. Typically, this occurs in the British system. So to put that in writing, we could just say here, the control is vested on an individual whom powers have been conferred by the parliament. And authority remains, authority remains until parliament loses confidence. I hope this makes sense. So a parliamentary executive is where you are not elected into that office. Rather, the parliament sits and decides who is vested with that authority. And you will remain in that position until the parliament loses confidence in either your abilities or your power to continue to lead into the state. So obviously, if this is what parliamentary means, then we already know what non-parliamentary system is. So we can see an example of a country that practices this would definitely be the UK, or we can say Britain. That is how the prime minister is appointed. Now for a non-parliamentary executive, non-parliamentary executive, here, the parliament is not involved in appointing or determining who occupies that position. So, there is no parliament involvement. And the president is usually elected by electorates. So an example of a country that practices this is the United States. Very, very simple. Now let's highlight some of the key functions of the executive. So we have functions of the executive. First and foremost, policy formulation. policy formulation. As we mentioned earlier, policies are what, you know, guide and direct um, affairs of a state. And these policies are formulated by the executive, right? So they could also, you know, be in charge of initiating bills. Initiating of bills. So I wanted to put this right immediately because it's very similar. When we get to um, legislature, we can now understand better what bills are, but just know that the executive, one of their functions is to initiate bills. Similarly, what they do, they also enforce, stroke, implement laws. Here we're looking at the police, the armed forces. These are one of their key roles to enforce and implement laws. 
also the executive is in charge of creating budgets they're in charge of creating budgets i hope you know what budgets are a budget is usually a government's proposed document that contains the amount of money they intend to raise and the amount they, they intend to spend for that you know particular fiscal year so the the the, the, the executive is responsible for policy formulation they're responsible for initiation of bills enforcing stroke implementing laws creating budgets the executive in the position of the president is also responsible for appointments right there are various roles that are usually appointed and approved by the president only. For example, the roles of ministers. I hope you know that the president appointed himself as the minister for petroleum. Do you understand? So these are powers that have been legally conferred on the executive and they can do it without any um, repercussion from the law without any repercussion from the law. Another function of the executive is pardoning of criminals, right? This is also one of the roles that have been provided to the president. The president could walk into a prison and then maybe at, at the end of every year, they are allocated a specific number of prisoners that they can give pardon. And that pardon is binding. It means that whatever crime that they were convicted for, they are now fully let go of such crimes. So there are a whole lot more functions and it's important as students to always read ahead beyond what you know, the teacher has provided just so we have like an idea of everything that should be here. Now, having looked at the executive arm, let's look at the next arm of government, which is the legislature, right? The legislature is one of the most important of the three arms of government because the laws that are being made are what help us maintain law and order in the society, which is also another function of the executive. Maintaining law and order. Recall, police will always tell you that they are your friends. Whenever you have issues, whenever you have complaints, it's important that you take them straight to the executive, always report to the police, and therefore they can have the power to ensure that, you know, whoever is disturbing or, or harassing you can stop. So these are one of the roles of the executive. So back to the legislature, I was explaining how important the legislative arm of government is. So this is the arm of government. This is the arm of government responsible for making laws. This is a very important function of, you know, the entire governmental body. Because if laws are not made, there will be no means of controlling citizens' actions. Right? So the legislature is responsible for making laws, and those laws are usually binding on everyone, including themselves. There's a theory that says that there is no one that is above the law. And that principle is called the rule of law. No one is above the law. So we need to ask ourselves what exactly are the functions of the legislature? So we want to look at the functions. of legislature. The major function of the legislature is lawmaking. So we have it here as law making. Here, they're responsible for determining the laws that need to be enforced and then they determine you know, how exactly to enforce it. The next function of the legislature is Amendment of Constitution. I hope you remember what the Constitution is. The Constitution is, you know, the book of laws that guide the affairs of a state. However, we see that the Constitution needs to be amended in order to reflect current or present realities. 
We've had numerous constitutional amendments and at a future time on this course, would walk through all of that. But the responsible party for the amendment of that constitution is what we call the legislature. Also, the legislature has what we call the power of investigation. Power of investigation. So the legislature has been given the power to investigate actions that might be seen as unlawful. Does that make sense? Yes. Next, we have, they have another power called the power of questioning. Here, this is directly to the executive body, where they feel that there is a questionable action or a policy being enforced or implemented. It is the role of the legislature to question, do you understand, those um, actions and ensure that they are within the confines of the law. Basically, everything that the legislature do is in a way to check and balance what the executive does and ensure that everything that the executive does is in line with the laws. In that vein, we need to look at the various forms of legislative body. So we have the forms of legislature. There are two in number. We have one, the bicameral legislature, and then we have the unicameral. legislature. Please note, here in Nigeria, the legislative body is known as the National Assembly. Right? It is known as the National Assembly. Now, the National Assembly here in Nigeria is divided into two. We have the Senate House, and then we have the House of Representatives. We'll look at that in further detail later. While in the United States, their National Assembly, so this is Nigeria. In the US, their legislature house is divided into the House of laws and the house of commons. So basically what the legislature is, is a lawmaking body that is usually divided into chambers. From what we can see here, it means that there are always two chambers. We have the upper chamber, which is the chamber that usually consists of sophisticated individuals. And then we have the lower chamber. Right? So as we can see, the Senate House in Nigeria is the upper chamber, House of Representatives, lower chamber. For the US, we have the House of Laws. And then for the, for the, um, for the UK, we have the House of Laws. And then we have the House of Commons. Right? So, again, this bicameral system is what we're trying to identify here. What exactly do we call a bicameral legislature? Now, bicameral legislature is where there exist two chambers responsible for the lawmaking of a particular responsible for the lawmaking in a particular state. So if we are to look at bicameral legislature now, we said this is a two, two chamber, is a two chamber legislative body. responsible for lawmaking. 
So this is gotten from, you know, Greek words. By here means to, and camera is gotten from camera, which means chain. So it's basically a two-chamber legislative body that's responsible for lawmaking. I recall that I mentioned that we have the upper chamber, comprised of individuals with high expertise and skills, right? So the upper chamber is a more sophisticated chamber within the legislative arm. And then subsequently, we have the lower chamber, which guarantees representation. Now, like I mentioned earlier, the bicameral legislation is, it's practiced in Nigeria here, it's practiced in the United States, it's practiced in the UK as well, that is in Britain. And then they have various names for their various legislative bodies. Now we need to ask ourselves, what exactly are the benefits of this bicameral legislation? Should we opt for it or why not use the other one which we are yet to define? So let's highlight some key merits of bicameralism. Number one, it boosts the scrutiny of laws passed. Where there are two chambers in which the laws first go through the lower chamber and then eventually get to the higher chamber. It means that they are rest assured that sufficient scrutiny has been done, you know, on those laws passed and the quality of the laws passed will be very rich such that it does not, you know, oppress any party and neither does it give advantage to any party. Another very important merit of this system of legislature is that it provides checks and balances. And hope you know that checks and balances usually boost efficiency in any organization. Now, where there is a lower chamber you know and a higher chamber and both chambers although acting independently have the right to you know question the the um characters the laws the bills passed from the other chamber it sort of puts everyone on their toes and ensure that no one is doing things for their own personal interest or for their own personal gain it sort of puts objectivity to things and that's why we believe that the system of checks and balances provided by the bicameral legislature is one that is very very suitable also it gives access to mature and experienced legislature mature and experienced legislators now recall we said the upper chamber is usually made up of sophisticated and you know highly knowledgeable individuals now having such high knowledgeable or experienced legislators on board also boosts the quality and you know the speed of lawmaking in a particular country so you see bicameralism on its own has advantages ranging from the fact that the laws being passed under a bicameral legislature could be said to, you know, have better foundational roots. And then in the entire process, it ensures that the laws being passed were broken down and scrutinized line by line. Now, we've identified some benefits. However, what are the demerits of this system?
Number one, it delays decision or lawmaking. So it delays lawmaking. So this is a major turn off for the bicameral legislature. Knowing that laws have to be passed first through the lower chamber and then to the upper cha chamber sort of increases the amount of time spent on making these laws and those delays could be detrimental. Also, we can say that having two legislative chambers that would both be paid for doing the same service can be a waste of resources. So it's a waste of limited resources. Also, this system is not suitable. It is not suitable for cases of emergencies. Similarly, this bicameralism contributes to dumping activities. I would explain that. Now, it is a theme across countries, not just Nigeria, where if um, an individual vice for the position of maybe a president or a minister or a governor and they lose, the National Assembly is usually the dumping ground for such individuals. So it means that at the end of the day, just because they've created a niche in terms of favoritism with the people, they've been able to interact with them, they can easily end, end up, you know, giving themselves that, um, it's like a relief package that, uh, oh, as I'm unable to be governor, perhaps I can just manage National Assembly. Regardless of the fact that they may not be suitable for that particular role. And at the end of the day, the people who suffer it are the citizens. Because it is these people that are placed with the very crucial responsibility of making laws. Now we've looked at bicameral legislature. Let's look at the unicameral legislature. We have the unicameral legislature. Recall we said bicameralism came from Greek words by and camera, meaning two and chamber. Uni obviously means one, and camera still remains chamber. So we thus can be find this is a single chamber right it is a single chamber legislative body responsible for making laws recall i mentioned that in this system, we have countries like the UK, we have the US, we have Nigeria. Very few countries practice unicameral legislature because the bicameral is widely popular. So examples of countries practicing this, we have Israel, we have Bulgaria, and so on and so forth. So these are two countries that we see practicing the unicameral legislature. Now, what is the feature of this unicameral legislature? As we explained from the name, there is only one single chamber responsible for making laws. Now, we we'll now ask ourselves, what is the merit or are there any merits of unicameralism? First and foremost, we know that this
reduces time in lawmaking process. Because it is a single chamber legislative body, right? Decision making in terms of law passing and bills is done in just one chamber. So it means once one, one session is held just with the single chamber, nothing else is taken to any other chamber and the bills can be faster. So significantly, it is suitable in periods of emergency. For example, when the world was spiraled into the COVID-19 pandemic, numerous laws needed to be made. Countries like Israel and Bulgaria with a single chamber, um, with a single chamber legislative body could have easily passed their laws maybe within a matter of maybe hours or, meet, or minutes. However, for countries like Nigeria and the United States, where we would need to pass it from one chamber to the other, we have delays. And those delays are very crucial, simply because most times laws need to be made at the nook of time. So similarly, unicameralism, right, does not contribute to wasted financial resources. Also, it does not practice duplication of roles. Right? It is believed that what is done at the lower chamber is quite similar to what is done at the upper chamber. So why then are we duplicating these roles? Regardless of the fact that, you know, system of checks and balances are in place and the quality of, this, of laws made are, you know, superb and, you know, expected, it sort of seems redundant that we have to hire people for roles that have already been hired for. Finally, we can also say that a benefit of, you know, the unicameralism is that it is ideal for small countries, right? Unlike Nigeria, that is multi, you know, that has multiple ethnic groups, multiple tribes, regions, right? We can't really use this um, unicameral system. Another benefit of bicameralism is that it encourages representation. Right? In terms of the fact that, or if I'm, if I'm to break down the National Assembly in Nigeria, right? I hope you know that the Senate House is made up of 109 members here in Nigeria, which is comprised of three senators. Three senators from the 36 states and one from the Federal Capital Territory. So once you multiply that six by three, you have 108 and then the last person from FCT. Now with this, we can see that each state within this country is properly represented. And that is one of the benefits of bicameralism. However, the House of Rep is usually made up of 360 seats comprised of political parties. Let me give you a fun fact. Over 70% of the seats in the House of Representatives is occupied by the ruling party, which is the APC. So about 227 seats out of 360 is occupied by APC. And then we have about 121 for PDP. And then, you know, PMP and all the other smaller parties get to share of the rest with one vacant seat. So you sort of see how the National Assembly, that is the legislature, is usually reflective of the current ruling party because you know that President Mohamed Bari is a member of the APC. 
And that's why you can see that reflecting in the number of seats allocated to that particular party. It means that most times we can see some of the defectiveness of our Nigerian legislative system. How more than half of the seats is occupied by the ruling party. It means that is there really a system of checks and balances between the legislature and the executive? Let's, when we move to judiciary, we would most likely find out. So we've looked at uh, major merits of this, um, of this legislative um, type of legislative arm. So let's look at some of the disadvantages, right? Most of the disadvantages are quite similar to the things that we cannot get in bicameralism. One, it could contribute to hasty lawmaking. It could contribute to hasty lawmaking. Also, right, we could say that the unicameral legislature gives no room for checks and balances within its chamber. So we can say there is no room for checks and balances within the chamber. Right? Generally, these are some of the demerits of unicameralism. And with further reading, you'll probably be able to find out more things that makes this less attractive than the bicameral legislature. Still under the legislature, there's something we need to look at, which is what we call bills. Bills want to look at bills. What are bills? I'm sure I've used that word quite a number of times. So, let's take a look at it. Bills. What are bills? Bills are simply proposed actions that are being laid before the legislative body that upon approval become laws. In summary, bills are proposed laws. So before a law is enacted, it usually starts from what we call a bill. So to define this, we can say bills are proposed actions raised in the legislature or legislative body upon approval they become laws so we can say of which giving approval they become laws. Simply put, bills are proposed. Now, the process of drafting a bill or turning a bill into law in Nigeria is quite a lengthy one. This is because, for starters, bills could come from various bodies it could come from the different arms of government. Nonetheless, it still goes through the same process. The bill will be drafted. It will, be, it will have its first reading. It will have its second reading. It will be taken to the committee, committee stage. And then it will now pass through all the arms of the National Assembly before it is approved by the president. Please note, bill to be passed into law for a bill to be passed into law, right, it must be approved by the president. 
So this is very important. And that's why when we're listing, you know, the functions of the executive, we put approval because it's one of the functions of the president um, or the presidential rule. Now, what are the types of bills that we have? What are the types of bills? Basically, there are three types of bill. One, we have public bills. Two, we have private member bills. And three, we have money bills. Now let's explain it. First off, we have the public bills. Public bills are bills that are initiated by the executive body and usually at, at, um, seek to address issues confronted by the entire country. So we said public bills, these are bills initiated by the executive and usually confront national issues. By national issues, we mean issues faced by members of the country. So we have that as public bills. Now, on the other hand, private bills are bills initiated by members of the executive. And you see that that's why it's called private member bills. That's why it's called private member bills because they are initiated by members of the legislature. Finally, money bills. This is another bill that is initiated by the executive. It is a bill that includes the amount of money that the executive intends to raise and spend for a particular period. So basically, money bills are budgets. So how budgets work, right? The budget is created by the executive and then given to the legislature. It would pass through the two chambers of the legislative arm. Scrutiny will be done, adjustments, questioning, you know, they would interrogate. And then, upon recommendation from the National Assembly, the president can now approve the budget. So basically, money bills are initiated by the executive and contain proposal for amount to raise and spend for the country's physical fiscal year it is basically as we said it is basically a budget so these are the three major types of bills we have and as we mentioned it is part of the primary duties of the legislature to ensure that bills are passed into law. So now that we have looked at the executive and on the legislature, before we move to the final arm of government, which is the judiciary, we'll take a 10 minutes break. At this point, you are advised to, you know, look at things that we have learned today. If you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the comment section. And then when we get back in the next 10 minutes, feeling refreshed, Get a drink of water if you want to drink. Just relax. And then we look at the final arm of government and then we can complete this model. For our break, um, we looked at the arms of government. We looked at the executive and then we looked at the legislature. Right now, we want to look at the final arm of government, which is the judiciary. Now, who are the judiciary? We said the judiciary is the arm of government that is responsible for interpreting laws 
and then applying existing ones. So basically, when the legislature makes laws, right, it is the responsibility of the judiciary to interpret it. And please note that this interpretation does not occur like maybe, oh, they'll go on the news and then they say, oh, law number one, this is what it means. No. We interpret laws by means of institutions set up called courts. So the court or the court system is the institution by which the judiciary, you know, performs their core duty of interpreting laws. So putting that into definition, this is the arm of government responsible for the interpretation and of new laws. So they are responsible for the interpretation of new laws and the application of existing laws. So recall I said the judiciary is or performs their core functions by means of court systems. Right, so in Nigeria, right, courts range from the apex court, which is the Supreme Court. Then we have various appeal courts, appeal courts, we have high courts or state courts. And then we have magistrates, courts, and customary courts. So these are the various courts that have judges. Please note, in the judiciary, we have what we call judges. These are the persons that are vested with the knowledge, skills, expertise, and power to interpret the laws. What it means is that they must have gone through law school, they must have had a degree in law, gone to law school, and then become barristers, and then they can now be appointed as judges. Right? So we have them in different ranges of courts. And maybe when we look at courts in a future model, we'll see how these various courts work, the powers that they have, and so on and so forth. Now, there's a popular saying that goes, the judiciary is the last hope of the common man. This is because they perform very unique functions. And as such, we must look at the functions of the judiciary. The first function or role of the judiciary or the judicial system is the interpretation. So we have the interpretation of laws. Let's assume that Shegun steals a goat from his neighbor and his neighbor then sues Shegun to court. Obviously, the first thing they will do is to go to the police. Recall we talked about the executive and we mentioned that the role of the executive is to enforce laws. Obviously, stealing is a crime, and as such, it shouldn't be done. So it means Shagun will be taken to the police station, and then the police will now arraign Shagun to court, and then he will now stand for trial. Now, it is at that point, the judge within the judicial system will now interpret the laws. For your crime, this is what your crime entails, and this is your so 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 punishment. Also, the judiciary is in the business of settling disputes. So one of the core functions of the judicial system is settlement of disputes. Many a time, rather than fight physically or, um, you know, take violent measures, usually individuals take their problems to the court 
And this is what we call mediation. Here, the judge is standing as an independent body that will be responsible to listen to both parties, understand their grievances, and help them amicably resolve their disputes. Another, um, another function of the judiciary is also to interpret the Constitution. Interpret the Constitution. Remember, the Constitution is the most binding law in every country or state, and as such, is the role of the judicial system to interpret the Constitution. They also are in the business of safeguarding, safeguarding the rights of citizens. Rights of citizens. Whenever a human right has been violated, your first place of recourse is to go to the judicial system, right? Another function of the judiciary, protection against violence. I'll explain. In more advanced society, whenever an individual feels threatened by another, they could go to court and request for restraining order. The term restraining order is an instrument of the judicial system that can help ensure that citizens are protected. So we can just generally call this protection of violence or protection of individuals. Because there are various bits, man mandates that could be issued by the law court that in general protects the interest. See the peculiar roles that the judiciary performs and so many more, which I encourage you to read up and expand your knowledge. You see why we say that the judiciary is the last hope of the common man. However, for them to properly execute or perform this function, the judicial system or the judicial must have certain characteristics. So we're looking at the characteristics or features of the judicial system. Another form has is what we call the power of review. They can not and that's why police, even ministers, even members of the executive can be charged to court and actually convicted. Very key features that the judicial system must have ensure that they can actually in their capacity as the last first so this is the most important that that what we call independence Of have free from bias, right? So that they can judicial system that is politically neutral. We have what we call political neutrality. They should be of you know the APCs and the PDPs. This is because these political parties are called interest groups, and their major role is the interest of their members. However, for the judiciary to indeed be independent, they must at first be political, politically neutral. Should be a member of any political. Another feature that secures their role as last hope of the common 
is what I call relative relative just for the flow of you know activities for continuity the egg should not be given the power to just change change a judicial um, or a judge simply because the judge is maybe putting things in their favor so they must have relative permanence so that they can always secure the last support commoner you told me that how they interpret laws the manners in which they interpret laws must be relatively permanent Another very important feature is immunity. Immunity. It is very important that the judicial system is provided with some sort of immunity. This is because when or for a judge to act independent or impartially, it means that it will make decisions that are likely to affect, you know, high powers, executive members, legislative members. However, when they have that diplomatic immunity, it absconds them from the personal effect of their judgments. So it sort of keeps the, the judgments they make down to the rope and it cannot be against them. So these are the honesty. Code of conduct. Due process. Code of conduct. It means that at every point in time where a judge is making, you know, is placing threat or interpretive, it must follow. The so it means that it must ensure follow that due process and act. Equitable and reasonable of we have looked at the major features of the judicial system, which the judicial system must have for it to be the moment. Let's look at something like the independence. of the two bodies that is the executive and the legislature so we said independence please note without independence the judicial system cannot be impartial remember that one of the Not made because he's evil. The laws are not made because he's my brother. The laws are not made because he's this. The laws are made because this is what the law is. Right? So where executive and the legislature cannot influence, and where the judiciary can be independent in its decision making, then you can say there is impartial and it is free from. 
Now the last concept that we need to look at as it relates to the executive judiciary is what we call parliamentary parliamentary supremacy. This is very similar to the independent of the judiciary. We said this is where the legislature is able to make and unmake laws without the influence of external, of external factors. Here, we can say that the parliamentary is... Remember we said the legislative house in states are always called the parliament, but the result for making laws. So we said where they can make and make laws without interference from any external party, that's international or national, then the parliament is supreme. However, so limitations. We have limitations. to parliamentary supremacy. The first one we have is called constitutional limitations. Whatever it is that, whatever laws that want to be made or whatever policies that are about to be enforced if the constitution limits the powers, those powers are deemed limited whatever actions whatever policies that will be made and they go against the parliamentary supremacy because the law What we mentioned sorry, is to interpret whether they just applying it what we call in the past a law judgment was that executive judiciary the right stop you know, the executive parliamentary. What we call interest groups. These are
Passion is international laws and treaties. The arms of government are very fundamental. However, there are other elements that we would need to take through in this course. I really hope that we enjoyed today's class. I look forward to seeing you in the next class where we'll be looking at basic concepts in government. Thank you so much for listening. I hope to see you in the next class.